Lecture number one, James Bannerman, background in history. You understand that the disciplines of history and theology are often separate in a seminary curriculum, and that makes sense. Systematic theology has for its main text the Bible and secondarily confessions or other written texts in the tradition where History looks more broadly at various movements, events, figures. So they do approach the material differently. And yet, the two must always intersect because you can't learn about Christian history if you don't know about the theological debates that are there. And we can't understand theology if we don't understand what prompted someone to write these things, to say these things, to put together this confessional statement. It's too easy for Christians, even smart seminary students like yourself, to approach theological texts as if they represent a brain in a vat somewhere, some brilliant mind who is divorced from historical context or controversy. And wouldn't it be nice, we're all caught up in all of the debates of our day and all the personalities and the political infighting, and these brilliant minds from the past just in rarefied air wrote their works and dropped them down from heaven. Of course, we know that's not the case. There is a sort of historical approach, you might call the great thinker's approach to history, and there's, there's merit to looking at various great thinkers throughout history, a great books program. That's really good so long as we understand that these great thinkers and texts did not just drop down out of heaven, or they weren't discovered like golden plates by Joseph Smith somewhere in the ground, but they were written for a reason with a specific historical context and controversy in mind. And that is especially true and important as we read The Church of Christ by James Bannerman. As I said, I don't assign the text because I agree with every jot and tittle in it, though I agree with most of it. He is a defender of the establishment principle, that is the idea that the church, though not created by the state, should be supported, defended, and promoted by the state. This view is held by very few persons in America, at least, but has was the default position for a whole lot of church history, almost all of church history. So we need to understand why he believed it and should we or should we not believe it. You would, so why did I sign this text? Because you would be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive treatment of Presbyterian polity. Uh, this is Reformed Theological Seminary and Reformed with a capital R involves Presbyterian polity. Now, we already had introductions in this class to know that people come from lots of different backgrounds, and perhaps the majority are now in some kind of Presbyterian context, but we have wonderful Baptist brothers and sisters here and other from different non-denominational categories. So I am a Presbyterian pastor. This is Reformed Theological Seminary. I hope to be respectful to differing views, and yet this is a class where I will be putting forth an argument for Presbyterian polity, for a certain understanding of elders and church office, and especially when we come to the sacraments. But you'll find really from the very first day, this is today, that issues start to come up that Baptist friends and Presbyterian friends just to name the two main groups. Obviously, Lutherans have a a certain view and Anglicans, but those would be the main divergent paths in in this class. We'll already start to sniff out some disagreements. And uh, just be careful. If you get to, you know, the middle of this class and you haven't found any disagreements with what I'm saying, you might end up a Presbyterian by the time you're, you're done with it. So just be careful. Uh, we will have opportunity to, to talk about some of those issues and glad to have people from all sorts of different backgrounds here. But that's where I'm coming from. That's what you'll be getting, hopefully, respectfully. 
One of my aims in this class is for you to see how so many of our contemporary issues really are about ecclesiology. When you think of the important theological topics, of course they're all important, but you might more readily gravitate toward theology proper and the doctrine of the Trinity or soteriology and justification and how we're saved and certainly the Christology, the person and work of Christ. What we will find is that most, let's say many of the issues that you're reading about online, that you're talking about, that you will find very practically in church ministry have to do with ecclesiology. Probably the biggest theological category that is at issue in our day is anthropology. What is man? What, are, what does it mean to be male and female? Are there males and females? What about marriage? All of those issues. But second to that, I would say, is ecclesiology. Think about it. Who can be a member of the church? What are the offices of the church? How is discipline to be administered and by whom? Who can be admitted to the sacraments? What is the proper relationship between church and state? What's the right relationship between pastors and politics, between Christ and culture? What is the nature and basis for church unity? What is the mission of the church? What are the marks of the church? These are all relevant questions, and I hope to cover them in some way or another in this class. Typically, evangelical theology has not been strong on ecclesiology. They've been strong on soteriology, strong perhaps on the doctrine of Scripture, but ecclesiology has not been a strength. Just to mention two of my heroes, Charles Hodge, had no section on ecclesiology in his three-volume systematic theology. You could argue he was getting to it, and he just didn't, but that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my great preaching heroes, can be, I have to admit, rightly criticized for preaching and writing very little about matters pertaining to the doctrine of the church. It was much more of a, a free-for-all, not that they didn't have sacraments or ordinances, or, but it wasn't something that was given a lot of thought and attention. Uh, and apart from what Nine Marks has done, and I have lots of friends in Nine Marks circles, uh, I, I love the Nine Marxists, they are great. <laughs> and they have done great work, Mark Dever is a friend, all those guys, of, of re-infusing Baptist circles with good ecclesiology, really strong, robust Baptist ecclesiology. Uh, and outside of that, though, your average free church, non-denominational church, independent church, let alone charismatic church across evangelicalism doesn't think a lot about ecclesiology. Even in Presbyterian circles, where you have a book of church order and you have more people paying attention to these things, often outside of a few basics, it gets to be sort of a free-for-all. So I've chosen Bannerman for his carefulness, his order, his thoroughness. And if you are a Presbyterian already and you're pursuing ministry in a Presbyterian context, then you are going to find your heart a flutter many times. <laughs> Pitter Pat with his high divine right Presbyterianism. If you are not, we're glad you're here. And I think you'll still find it immensely useful. You'll agree with a lot of it. And then it will highlight other differences that you may have. The other reason for choosing Bannerman is because there's great value in trying to master one man's thought in one book. So I, it's just my philosophy, I like to assign one major book. Let's dive deep into one man's thought. Even if we end up not agreeing with everything, let's try to inhabit his mind and understand what he's doing. Let me say something then about James Bannerman himself, because it's very important to understand what is standing behind so much of what he's writing about. James Bannerman was born to James Patrick Bannerman, a Church of Scotland minister on April 9, 1807 in Perthshire, Scotland, a large county in central Scotland, north of Edinburgh. 
He received his education at the University of Edinburgh in 1833. Then he became a minister at a town, Ormiston, a small village. And almost all of Scotland was small villages. In the south, in 1849, he was appointed professor of apologetics and pastoral theology at the Free Church's New College in Edinburgh. I'll say more about where New College came from in just a moment. In 1850, he received an honorary doctorate from Princeton Seminary here in the States. So that shows something of the cross-pollinization and the esteem that he was held. Bannerman died on March 27, 1868. So 1807, 1868, only 60 years old. He and his wife had six daughters and three sons, nine kids. Wow, what a holy number. Uh, one of his sons, David Douglas Bannerman, was responsible for seeing that his ecclesiology lectures were put into print shortly after his father's death. So what you have here are his ecclesiology lectures in the New College in Edinburgh, and after his death, his son put them into this form. You can you, you can tell that this, these were good lectures. They're, they're orderly. You can follow his outline. And like verbal communication, there is some repetition, but it's not highfalutin language. It's, it's, it's not hard to read. Uh, if you look in some of the, the prefatory matter in the book, you can see that the Church of Christ was reprinted by the Banner of Truth in 1960. And then in 1974, based on the two volumes printed in 1869, so this book comes out first, a year after his death, 1869, Banner of Truth, so grateful for the work they do, brings it out. And then this one-volume edition, I had the two volumes, and then this one-volume edition was released in 2015. It even has a blurb from Carl Truman and Kevin DeYoung. They were hard up for blurbs. Who wants to read this book and write us a blurb? Those are the only two, two guys they, they could get. Uh, if you are going to understand this book most effectively, it would be helpful to understand something about the immediate context in Scotland and in Scottish church history. So some background. Scotland, recall, unlike England had a thoroughgoing reformation and was, since the time of Knox, deeply Presbyterian. So usually dated to 1560, Presbyterianism is established in Scotland. That Presbyterian settlement, establishment, was interrupted by periods of persecution and episcopacy. Episcopacy means rule by bishops. And to the Presbyterians, this was anathema. That you would do away with our elder, orderly Presbyterian system and impose upon us your rule of bishops. Of course, you have to remember it's not just a theological controversy at this time. It's always a political and it's sometimes an international conflict. Episcopacy often imported foreign power and foreign control over the Church of Scotland. The Glorious Revolution comes in 1688, William and Mary, Protestant ascendancy on the throne, and they reestablish Presbyterianism in Scotland. Some important dates, May 1, 1707, is the union of Scotland and England. It's very confusing for us Americans, I know not everyone's Americans. It's probably confusing for everyone unless you're there, maybe even if you are there. How, how many countries are there? The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Are you one country? Are you two countries? Are you four countries? Sort of depends on their, they do it one way for the Olympics and another way for the World Cup and just however they want to figure it out. So the United Kingdom... The crowns of Scotland and England had been united since 1603 with James I, who had been James VI in Scotland. That's the James of the King James Bible. But now, May 1st, 1707, is the union of two parliaments. So the parliament now based in London and Westminster. So this is the date of the, the union of England and Scotland 
officially, are they one country? Well, they're a united kingdom now. The kingdom of Scotland and the kingdom of England, formerly two separate states with two separate legislative branches, but with one monarch, now become, quote, united into one kingdom by the name of Great Britain. So uh, just as an FYI, Britons like this can refer to Englishmen, Scotsmen, but you don't ever want to call a Scotsman an Englishman. That's, they're not, but they are Britons. They live in Great Britain. So the two become united in one kingdom. This leads to what is lurking behind this entire book. <clears throat> and it'd be good to know this, the Patronage Act of 1712. Patronage was for 150 years or more the pressing issue at all times in the Scottish church. Some background. There's something called the Golden Act of 1592. The Scottish Parliament established Presbyterianism as the only lawful form of church government. The, they had the second book of discipline. Presbyterianism was instituted earlier, but it gets interrupted by episcopacy. But in 1592, the Scottish Parliament establishes Presbyterianism, the only lawful form of church government. So an established church, and this is the only way you can organize church. Obviously, they believed it was biblical, and Presbyterians, we believe it is biblical. It's also true that Presbyterianism, why did Presbyterianism find root in Scotland in a way that it never did in England? Well, most historians believe, at least part of it was, Presbyterianism was well-suited to the clannish nature of Scotland, that you you already had the importance of local control, family clans, local organization around churches in small villages. So to bring Presbyterianism into that system would have made some intuitive sense. And to bring, to have bishops, to have your head of the church in Rome or in Canterbury would have been and was anathema to most Scottish people. This made more intuitive sense, and they believed it was biblical to have Presbyterianism, to have local control, local groups of men, of presbyters who are leading and shepherding the churches. Into this Presbyterian system, however, comes patronage. Patronage was well established by the beginning of the 17th century. What, it, what is patronage? Well, it means that a patron would present a minister to the congregation. You understand patronage in a general sense can, you know, you could have a benefactor, your patron who supports you to, to do art and do sculpture or write poetry, but this is a patron who would present the minister to the congregation. The patron could be the king, it could be a university, it could be a town council, it could be a landowner, it could be an aristocrat, it could be some individual landed gentry. So there were many different categories of patrons. But whomever or whatever the patron was, that patron was the one who printed. So Christ Covenant Church is looking for a senior pastor. I hope that they're not. They it. it, it you don't have a, the elders form a search committee and send out and solicit resumes. And no, someone, you know, the, the mayor of Matthews or the general assembly of the state of North Carolina or the regents of University of North Carolina at Charlotte or the, who's some rich family around here? The what? The Belk. the Belk family. They we do have a Belk in our church. So I, the Belk family. They the Levines. They present. Here's the man to be your minister. Patronage Act of 1712 reinstitutes this system. That glorious revolution, William and Mary, 
1690, patronage was effectively curtailed. Now, they still couldn't conceive of a world without patrons. They still didn't have search committees. But in beginning in 1690, the church could at least refuse the presentation, refuse the minister if they had good grounds. And then disputes would be handled by the presbytery. So at least there, uh, after William and Mary, you know, the Belk family presents to you your minister and your church can take a vote and you say, no, we don't want that minister. And if they, they get at loggerheads, the presbytery can intervene. At least there's some measure. You, you have to be accepting of the pastor. In 1712, the Patronage Act was passed. It was called a great grievance. It was the original Festivus, the airing of grievances. Now, patronage was less controversial in England. And you can make your guesses as to why in England, perhaps. Some have suggested that the English had much more of an aristocratic society already. The English tended to distrust popular opinion in more important matters. So what could be more important than choosing our pastor? Of course, the, a patron, a nobleman, is going to make a better choice than the common people. For whatever reason, and there were lots of reasons, it was never as controversial in England as it was in Scotland. But from 1712 for the next 150 years, patronage was the great grievance, the single most contentious issue in the Church of Scotland. Over and over, you can read about disputed settlements. There were many things that they disagreed with, and I encountered this all the time when I did my doctoral work on John Witherspoon. Witherspoon... Uh, all roads lead to, to Witherspoon, 1723, 1794. And uh, he, he comes to America in 1768. So the first 45 years of his life, he's in Scotland, and he pastors two churches, both in the Glasgow area, one in Beath, one in Paisley. And his book, which was a bestseller of the day, Ecclesiastical Characteristics, was in large part about patronage. There were... In the 18th century and into the 19th century, two parties, two factions in the Church of Scotland, variously organized. Uh, the moderates were more organized, but there was the moderate party and the popular party. You think of the popular party as, as the evangelicals. It's not exactly that the moderates were liberals, as we would think of them, but they were, they were sort of doctrinal latitudinarians. They didn't reject any particular doctrine, at least ostensibly, of the Westminster Confession, but they also didn't think it was terribly important. They were more interested in ethical matters, in virtuous living, in showing that Christianity was a reasonable faith. Lots of controversies, but this is systematic theology, not church history. So these were the two dominant groups in the Church of Scotland. And in addition to differences over theology, differences over how important the Westminster Confession was, differences over preaching style, the, th this issue of patronage was, this, was the most important defining issue, that the moderate party were acquiescent to patronage and the popular party, it's called the popular party, because they held that the popular opinion of the people in the church ought to hold sway and they ought not have to accept a minister that they did not want. Patrons during this time did not even have to be members of the Church of Scotland. And to make matters worse, you would sometimes have writing committees were called riding committees because they rode in on their horses. They, they, they rode in and were appointed by a presbytery and forcibly installed a minister into the church. So these riding committees were very unpopular. So a minister, a patron, 
would present the pastor to the congregation and the church votes on it and it's overwhelming that they don't want him and maybe even the local presbytery refuses we are not going to do a service of installation we are not going to make him well the larger synod or the general assembly or some could appoint a writing committee we're going to send in other presbyters and they're going to go ahead and install this pastor against the wishes of the congregation so you can imagine these were not popular groups there was all sorts of fallout from the patronage act how, uh, some of you how many of you are in the arp we got a few arp so the a now i know the arp in the united states is it's very complicated and lots of other groups came and went but originally the associate synod comes out of 1733 a secession in the Church of Scotland, the, the, uh, the Erskines, that's a big name in the ARP, Ebenezer Erskine. And one of the main reasons they secede from the Church of Scotland is over this issue of patronage in 1733. Thomas Gillespie in the Relief Church is another breakaway group in 1761. Now, there's other issues, but this is constantly coming up. In fact, every year, since 1912, for two generations, the General Assembly instructed a commission, quote, to make due application to the king and parliament for redress of the grievance of patronage. The instruction became a mere formality until under the, the when the moderates had full control, that was eventually dropped in 1784. But from 1712 to 1784, Every year, the General Assembly has a vote. Yes, send a message to the king and to Parliament. We don't want patronage. So coming to the 19th century in Bannerman's book, the important for all Presbyterians to know something of Scottish church history, the disruption. The issues in Scotland were theological, but they were often related to polity more than anything else. Why such a big book on polity? Because so many of the controversies had to do with how churches were run from the beginning because Presbyterianism was established as the only recognized system of government. There were constantly questions and controversies surrounding the relationship between church and state. By the time you get to the 19th century, there were essentially three different positions. Okay, you got some of this Patronage Act of 1712. Get that in your notes. 1707, the Union. We'll keep the disruption up there as we're coming to that. Well, we'll say much more about these three categories in the weeks ahead. But roughly speaking, there were three different understandings of how church and state related to each other. One called Erastianism. It was named after a 16th century Swiss physician and Zwinglian theologian Thomas Erastus. There likely were not many people in Scotland who were ostensibly arguing for Erastianism, but some had a position which essentially amounted to the same thing. What was Erastianism? Erastianism held that there was state control over the church, that the church was a creation of the state. You just, it's more complicated than that, but that's the simplest rubric the state control over the church now, as we'll see most people weren't saying that but the, the modern regime so ruled in a way that they almost acknowledged the state's authority over the church second say those who held to the establishment principle as we've already said, 
establishment principle holds that the church is supported, defended, and promoted by the state. Supported, defended, promoted by the state. So almost everyone in Scotland in the 19th century, 18th century, would have thought of themselves as a godly commonwealth. In fact, I think you could argue that for much of American history, certainly in the, the 19th century, all the way up to the middle of the 20th century, I mean, you can still find FDR making statements about who we are as a Christian people, whether he meant that or it was just language. But certainly in Scotland, almost everyone thought of themselves, uh, you know, we, this is a godly commonwealth. And the establishment principle held officially the state ought to support, defend, promote the church. The third option is the voluntary principle. Well, this is separation of church and state. Now, as we'll see in the weeks ahead, there certainly was a separation of church and state. Uh, even with the establishment principle, Scottish Presbyterians believed in two kings and two kingdoms. There was only, so when, so I say this when I do a baptism, maybe you've heard it in your church, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only king and head of his church, I declare that this child is baptized. If you hear that language, in the name of the only king and head of his church, that's said for two reasons. One, the pope is not the king, or the, the, the pope has no authority, so it's, it's, a, it's a poke at the, the Roman Catholics there, just if they're listening. Remember the Garrison Keeler, Lake Wobegon? He has an episode where he talked about Reformation Sunday and all the Lutheran churches sang a mighty fortress and opened the windows so that the Catholics could hear them singing. So it's that. But probably even more importantly, it was to assert there is no earthly king over this church. Now, wasn't that different than, than the Anglican church? King Charles is, his title is the defender of the faith. So in the name of the Lord, the only king and head of a church, we have no other king. The Pope is not a king here. King Charles, King James, Queen Elizabeth, they do not have authority over this church. I'm told a little accident, as it were, of history is that Queen Elizabeth II technically died as a Presbyterian because she died in Scotland. And when you were in, when the, when the sovereign would be in Scotland, you would take on the religion of that realm. And so she died in Balmoral Castle in Scotland. And so whenever she was in Scotland, she was a Presbyterian. So she is in the Presbyterian section of heaven. I do think uh, she was a, a believer. So the voluntary principle says the church, why voluntary? Because the church is supported by the voluntary contributions of the people. That's what voluntary there means. We are not supported by tax dollars. We're not supported by the crown or parliament or Congress. We are supported by the voluntary contributions of the people. This is the church tradition that almost all of us are a part of and probably seems just second nature. Of course, that's right. Bannerman will force us to think about, well, why is that right if it is right? There's a 10-year conflict in the Church of Scotland that leads to this disruption in 1843. In 1834, for the first time in a century, remember eight, uh, 1733, the, the Erskines leave, that's the secession of the Associate Presbyterian Church. For the first time in a century, 1834, the Evangelicals, the Popular Party, have a majority at the General Assembly. And they want to finally redress this grievance of patronage. And so the church passes... 1834, the Veto Act. So this is the church passing it, not parliament, but the church. Now, what do you think this act is? As the name suggests, the Veto Act said local congregations have the right to veto the minister that's presented by the patron. Parishioners could reject the patron's appointment. Again, it's not instituting a system of pastoral search committees, but it is 
strongly reasserting that the congregation must call you. So you give us a, a, a minister, we don't want him. You, you better give us another option until he's somebody that we want to call. We at least have the right to veto. This needed to pass a majority of the presbyteries, but even before it passed the presbyteries, the assembly put it into effect with a, a further act called the Interim Act. Okay, this has to uh, officially pass the presbyteries, but we're going to get we're going to get doing this right now w under this Interim Act. So within months, the act was put to the test by a disputed settlement. A man named Robert Young was presented to be a candidate in the parish of Ochterarder. If that name sounds familiar, uh, this is where Ochterarder, this is where the marrow controversies, you know, generations earlier had come from the, the presbytery there. But this is later in history, same place, Ochterarder. He was going to be the parish minister there. Only two, okay, let, just here's a little takeaway. If you only have two members of the congregation vote for your call, don't go there. He had only two parishioners sign his call. Because what's happening? The moderates are putting moderate men. It would be like the, you know, the Belk family, the, 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 the mayor of Matthews keeps giving to OPC, PCA, ARP, he, he gives you PCUSA ministers. I know, they're, okay, they're not all bad, but just you, you understand the analogy. Uh, gives, say, we, we do not want this minister. Two people vote for Robert Young, and out of 330 voting members, 286 come forward to object to his call. You got two people for you. <laughs> Two hundred and uh, three hundred and twenty-eight who didn't vote for you, and two hundred eighty-six who are against you. The case went to the court of session. That's like the the Supreme Court in Scotland, the court of session, where it was decided that the the Kirk, the, the established church, had acted beyond its legal power and had infringed upon the civil rights of patrons. So the assembly says we're going to test this. And they test it within months of passing the Veto Act, and it goes all the way up to the top. And they say, nope, church, you can't do this. You have infringed upon the rights of patrons. Furthermore, the church is described as a creation of the state deriving its powers from parliament. So this is sounding even worse. This is sounding like Erastianism in the court's decision that the church is a creation of the state. This was not... This was not their understanding of the establishment principle. No, no, no. The, the, the church was not governed. That's not what they meant by the establishment principle. The church was not governed by the king of, of England. It wasn't governed by some parliament. Jesus Christ was the only king. The state was something separate, but was meant to support and defend the church, but not exercise control, and it did not create the church. So this was wholly unacceptable, and the evangelicals, considered it an affront to the crown rights of Jesus Christ. The crown rights of Jesus Christ. Th this has a long history in Scotland. So uh, Christ's covenant, you know, we have the, oh, that's a terrible way of doing it, but, you know, we have the Celtic cross, and a lot of Presbyterian churches have the Celtic cross. Some of them, any of you ever been to Edinburgh? That's a few people in Edinburgh. St. Giles there on the Royal Mile uh, where John Knox was, the, the mother church of Presbyterianism, you look at their top of their steeple, and I'm, I'm terrible, you know, the, but, but the, it's a crown. So many of the Scottish churches had a crown, and this was long before this, this is, but to indicate the crown rights of Jesus Christ over this church. I got a text last night from... Chancellor Emperor Duncan, and uh, he was asking me about something, and we were texting, and he was, I think, getting ready to do his class. I said, I'm, I'm up tomorrow morning with Ecclesiology and Sacraments, and I'm going to talk about James Bannerman and the disruption and the crown rights of Jesus. 
he gave me several thumbs up emojis. He <laughs> said, I love it. So they were completely incensed by this ruling. The conflict came to a head, 1843. So this is 1834 Veto Act. Ten years this is bubbling and boiling and working through church courts, comes to a head. Now, sometimes we can look at our day and think, man, why can't Christians get along and there's so much drama and all of these fractures and tensions? And it's not excusing when, where those happen and they're sinful, but just realize there's always been a lot of drama in the church. So here's what happens in 1843. It came to a head when the outgoing moderator preached the opening sermon at that year's General Assembly. So that's the tradition. The outgoing moderator opens this year's assembly by preaching a sermon, and then, by tradition, he would constitute the assembly. He preaches a sermon, then he calls the assembly to order. Uh, do we have a quorum? All the good Presbyterian stuff brings them together. But instead of constituting the assembly, as, as was expected, he announced that he and others did not regard it as a free assembly, and they were leaving. So he read a protest, and he left the church, followed by uh, someone you've maybe heard of, Thomas Chalmers. There's a Chalmers Center at Covenant College. You've heard of some, a lot of people mention his famous sermon, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. He was a preacher. He was a social reformer. He has a statue there in Edinburgh. He was the leader of the evangelicals. So the moderator preaches the sermon, says, reads a protest, we're leaving. Uh, Thomas Chalmers, the leader of the evangelicals, comes with him. Close to 200 ministers and elders leave. So in the end, with this disruption, 451 ministers left, 752 stayed in. That's a big split. Often in church history, these splits are just a tiny fraction but 451 left, 752 stayed in. Uh, bring this history here to a, to a close and then give you an overdue break. Those who left, as you might imagine, sacrificed much in the way of social standing, in financial stability. I mean, the, the, the state is funding these churches. You just, you just left your pension, if they had pensions, you left your, your stable salary, your social position. This was a serious sacrifice. Chalmers was elected the first moderator of the Free Church of Scotland. And he said, quote, though we quit the establishment, we go out on the establishment principle. We quit a vitiated establishment, but would rejoice in returning to a pure one. We are advocates for a national recognition and national support of religion, we are not voluntaries. So he makes very clear, no, we're, we're not doing this. We still believe in the establishment principle, but we think the established Church of Scotland has been gutted. It's been vitiated. It's compromised. It's impure. And we are starting the Free Church of Scotland. Why free? Because free from the grievous act of patronage. They took their stand on two fundamental principles. Number one, the independent spiritual jurisdiction of the church. Independent, not from each other, they're Presbyterians, but independent from any state control or aristocratic interference. Independent spiritual jurisdiction of the church. And the second fundamental principle was the duty of the civil magistrate to further religion by supporting a national church. So very different, you know, it was 1776 and the Constitution 1789 in the United States, where at least on a federal level, now there still were state establishments in America, but at the federal level, we're having no established church. They would have agreed with the first principle, the independent spiritual jurisdiction of the church. But here in America, they had long ago said, and on a national level, we do not want the civil magistrate. He is not called upon to support, defend. We, have, we do not have an established church. Chalmers and the evangelicals were still saying, no, we, this is not us. We, we are not doing this. We're still doing this. 
but we want to do it with Christ as the head of the church and not these patrons. Just to tie together what is a very confusing denominational history after that, in 1900, so many of you have heard of the Free Church of Scotland, but what exists today as the Free Church of Scotland is very different than what came out of the disruption in 1843. In 1900, something called the United Free Church is established in Scotland, and it brings together most of the Free Church and also the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland, which was another amalgamation of different secession bodies. And just a few stand outside of that new union. Sometimes they were called the We Frees, W-E-E, -E, little, because there were just very few of them. They claim to be the true heirs to the disruption brethren. Now, one of the ironies of ecclesiastical history, this united free church eventually rejoined the established church. So the legacy of this disruption, most of, most of that heritage eventually comes back into the established Church of Scotland. In 1929, finally, patronage was abolished. Isn't that amazing? Not until 1929, maybe when the stock market crashed. We can't do this anymore. Uh, today, there's a continuing debate whether the Church of Scotland is an established church, certainly a, a failing church. It's probably best to say it's been disestablished, but there's still a national church with a number of surviving privileges. But most of the free church ends up folding into this other body, which eventually goes back into the main state church of Scotland. The, the we frees remain out, and there is still today then from, from that lineage, the free church of Scotland, and there have been other breakaways from that since then. So this gets us finally... James Bannerman. The Free Church started New College in Edinburgh. Have you ever been to Edinburgh and you're on Princess Street and you look across the little valley and just this beautiful, uh, you can see here, if you brought the book, you can see this nice engraving depicts the mound in Edinburgh with the Free Church College, the New College on the right. This really impressive, beautiful looking building. It was built at the enormous sum for the time at 50,000 pounds and opened, the first stone was laid in 1846, opened in November 1850. Today, New College in Edinburgh is a very well-respected institution. It would have some evangelicals, it would have non-evangelicals there. But when they opened, they had in those first, that first generation an illustrious faculty, Thomas Chalmers, David Welsh, that was the name of the retiring moderator who preached the sermon and then had everyone leave. They had John, quote, Rabbi Duncan, he's sometimes referred to, William Cunningham, James Buchanan, George Smeaton, James Bannerman. Uh, Banner of Truth has published most of these, republished their works. You can find them. So this James Bannerman is one of these disruption brethren, and these are the lectures Bannerman gave each winter session to fourth-year students at New College. So the end, this was part of the capstone of your seminary education, is Bannerman would give you these lectures on the Church of Christ, on Presbyterian polity. So it's important to understand this disruption and patronage and all because this book has a lot about church state relations much more than a systematic theology today would have because this was the issue in Scotland for 150 years and so he gives a lot of thought to it you have endured past the hour so let's take an 8 minute break uh, be back can we do questions when you come back all right we'll do questions when you come back at 9.55, we just have uh, about a half hour, and we'll start off with some questions. Okay, we have a, a half hour left. We left off at the end of Lecture 1, the history of the disruption in Scotland and the background to James Bannerman's book here, The Church of Christ. 
Right. So uh, it, we'll, we'll come to that, not this week, next week, and the week after. But the establishment principle, the short answer is it depends. The establishment principle has at times in church history meant that the state enforces both tables of the law, punishes blasphemers. The, in Scotland, they would certainly say that the, that the officers of the state do not have authority to meddle in the offices of the church. So the state is not doing church discipline, but the state, you know, it was taken as a given, for example, that of course you would want there to be laws against Sabbath business. Of course you would want the state to enforce Sabbath laws. The last... Uh, you know, and I've, we'll come to this. I mean, you, some of you may be following the, the Christian nationalism debates. I wrote a long review of Stephen Wolf's book on that. You can read it, and you'll know that I'm, I'm sympathetic to some of what he doesn't, what, some of the problems he sees, but I'm very critical of that book. And uh, I'm much more aligned with what I think is some of the wisdom of, the American tradition of, of not trusting whatever, whatever authority you give to the state is authority they can use against you. And so there's also an Augustinian distrust of human nature that has led good Presbyterians at times to say, I don't know that I want the state having anything to do with supporting the church because the state that can Support the church is also the state that can suppress the church. Uh, but we'll get to some of those arguments. So to your answer, Clay, the, the, last, the last person executed in the United Kingdom for blasphemy, uh, 16, I forget, 1690, whatever, Thomas Aikenhead, who was a student in Edinburgh. He was just 21 years old or something, and they overheard him. Uh, uttering, muttering blasphemies, and he was executed for blasphemy. It's a bit of a trivia question, but that shows you that even with an established church, was, uh, a, a long time had passed since they thought the state should be actively persecuting. Well, they wouldn't have seen it as persecuting. They would have seen it as upholding the dignity of a godly commonwealth, but enacting that sort of measure against those who are not a part of the true church. So we'll come to some of those debates. Other questions about this background. The, the popular party was always against patronage. The moderate party was, was supportive of patronage. I mean, they weren't, they didn't come out and they just, they were for the status quo. And in some ways you could argue they were the conservatives in that they said, hey, this way we've been doing things here is okay, and, and let's just keep going with it. And, you know, maybe it's not perfect, but the patrons have their right. And they were much closer to the elites. And because this is a rabbit trail, but because of patronage system was not just in the church, but it, it worked all throughout the United Kingdom and all throughout Scotland. And in particular, there was the Duke of Argyle, who through his patronage network, just almost, almost everyone who had some position of authority owed something to him. So to be in almost any position as an important solicitor or uh, important position in the university, somebody, some patron had given you that. So there, was, there, were, there were social reasons why the moderates who were in control and who are much closer tied to what you might say the elite uh, didn't want to bite the hand that was feeding them. Good question. Two, two things there. One, even if they had their own parliament, the patrons very likely would have been the same. Most, many, most of the patrons were local landed gentry or local town councils, so they probably would have had the same patrons and they probably would have had the same ministers presented to them. But your question raises a good point. Certainly it contributed to the, to the angst. That, if you remember, 1707 is the Union, 1712, 
okay, we, this doesn't look like a good deal anymore. And there's so many years, I mean, a brave heart has taught us anything is that the, 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 the Scottish and the English haven't always gotten along. So certainly that contributes that this patronage act was passed down in London at Westminster. So it would have made a difference just in the social acceptability and, you know, can we swallow this if they had felt like we made this decision for ourselves to reinstitute that. So that's a good point. Here we are, lecture number two, and we won't get very far into this, but here's the outline, lecture number two, so turn the page, defining the church, and these are our five Roman numerals, names, nature, attributes, marks, and members. Number one, then, <clears throat> names for the church. In the Old Testament, two words are commonly used, both meaning roughly assembly or gathering. So, Old, Old Testament, one is kahal, from an obsolete root meaning to call, and the other, edha, which means to, from a root meaning to appoint, or to meet together by appointment. So these two words, kahal and edha, are the two most common words in the Old Testament to describe some kind of assembly or gathering. The two words are often used together and will be translated as assembly of the congregation. Acts 12, 6, Numbers 14, 5, Jeremiah 26, 17. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for three passages that use assembly of the congregation, but just showing you that I've done my homework and it exists there. Assembly of the congregation, Sometimes the two words are used to signify a meeting of the people's representatives. Do turn here for a moment just so you can see it for yourselves. 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8, Solomon assembling and the ark brought to the temple. 1 Kings 8, beginning of the chapter, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of Israel of the tribes, the leaders of the father's houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Uh, I would argue that the description of the gathering in verses 1 and 2 are the same as those who are there in verse 5. So verse 5, the king and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled. So here's the congregation, here's the assembly but who's constitutive of the congregation and the assembly? Well, earlier we read, it's not every literal person in Israel, but he assembled the elders and the heads of tribes and the leaders of the father's household. Just here's one of the little breadcrumbs leading you to the feast that is Presbyterianism. Just if it's, if it, if it's possible that the assembled congregation, if the words for the congregation might be used at times to refer to the leaders or the representatives of the congregation, that suggests a certain role for the elders who, when they are assembled, can also rightly be called an assembly or, in our language, the church. The two words, uh, kahal and edha, are usually rendered in the Septuagint. Every time you say that, Will Ross uh, smiles somewhere in the city. Are usually rendered synagogue or ecclesia. So the New Testament, synagogue or 
Ekklesia are the two words, and those are the words that are rendered in the Greek Septuagint. Synagoge means to meet together. The, the, the prefix in Greek, soon, means together or with. Think about words we have like synergy or syncretism. Soon means together or with, so gathered together. And ecclesia, you know, the, the etymology is called out, ecclesia. Etymology doesn't always tell us the definition. By the first century, it means in general an assembly. Ecclesia called out, not called out ones of the world. Sometimes we, you know, that would be nice. We use that. We're the ecclesia. We're called out of the world. Well, we are called out of the world, but it was originally called out just meaning called out into the open for a gathering, for an assembly. And by the time of the New Testament, that's its basic meaning, which can be used in religious contexts or political contexts. It just meant you were out of your house and you were assembled. Synagogue, you can see the word there, synagogue, sometimes used as the building, Matthew 4.23, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And sometimes the gathering itself, Acts 13.43, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up. Now, I just mentioned that to you, Acts 13.43, after the meeting of the synagogue. So there, they're referring to the people gathered for their worship, the synagogue. And in Matthew 4.23, it says, teaching in their synagogues as a building. So I just, sometimes Christians want to freak out. The church is not a building, man. We're not a building. We're the people. Don't you dare call this a church. Well, there's precedent. Sometimes the synagogue referred to the people meeting. Sometimes it referred to a building. So it's okay. It's okay. I know. Maybe I'm not Puritan enough, but I think it's okay to call the church. Yes, you, the people, are the church, and you can also call the building a church. Synagogue. Ecclesia can be used for any assembly. So it's used in Acts 19, for example, the gathered assembly of Artemis worshipers. Well, it's not a explicitly Christian word. Jesus is the first to use it in an explicitly Christian sense, Matthew 16, 18. And on this rock, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. Now, in English, our word, church, or you've already heard me say it, the Church of Scotland is sometimes called the Kirk, or is this German, I think, Kirke? And in English, we just decided to use CHs, uh, which probably originally were pronounced as uh, hard K sounds, but now we say church instead of Kirk. You can see these are all related words, but they're not related to the word ecclesia, but to a different Greek word, kuriake. Kuriake meaning belonging to. To the Lord. The word kuriakon was then given to the place where God's people assembled to worship because it was a place that belonged to the Lord. So the etymology of our word church was actually derived from a, a place. It was a place designation. This again, why we don't have to freak out about calling a building a church. The kuriakon was a place where God's people gathered as the ecclesia to worship God in a place that was set apart, it was to the Lord, kuriake, a kirk. There are a number of metaphors for the church. So this is all still under this first Roman numeral names. Several metaphors for the church in the Bible. Let me uh, just mention several. One, buildings. 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together. 1 Peter 2, 5, you yourselves like living stones are built up as a spiritual house. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know your body is a temple? You are not your own. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, I'm writing these things so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So one metaphor for the church, see it there in many places, is a, is a building. Now that's it's a metaphor, so it's not speaking literally about the church building, but it's saying, what is this spiritual thing we call the church? Well, it's like a building. So what does that metaphor suggest? Well, it wants to suggest strength, stability, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. A building is something that doesn't move. Pillars, buttresses are there to, to support. And then the metaphor of foundation, because it's a building, there are certain Apostles and prophets that form the foundation of the church, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. So buildings, another metaphor, bodies. Romans 12, 4 and 5, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. 1 Corinthians 10, 17, we who are many are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, several places uses this body and member imagery. Ephesians 4, 12, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, his body. Colossians 1.24, in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. So a building and a body, this suggests the church must have connection to its head, its, its authority, its source, its nourishment, its direction is given by Christ, and we are members of it, membership is not a concept derived from the country club. It's from the Bible, a, a body part, a member. You join a local congregation to say, I am a part not only of the mystical body of Christ, but this particular local body of Christ. And as a member, I have a part to play, and I am connected with the other members. You can't be a, you know, someone who's not a member of a church is a, is a finger somewhere, or... I use this in the the book on why we love the church. If decapitation is removing the head, decorpulation is removing the body. And Christians who say, I don't want to be a part of a church, are I just have me and Jesus, is like carrying around the head of Jesus in a bucket just by yourself. I don't need the body. I've decorpulated. I've removed his body. I can't be bothered with the body of Christ. I just have his head. Here I am. The body of Christ of which we are members. So buildings, bodies, bride. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, Revelation 21, 9. The marriage of the lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready, Revelation 19, 7 and 8. 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12. I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Ephesians 5, of course. Marriage is a mystery which depicts... Christ and the church. So this metaphor speaks of intimacy, of union, of communion, of relationship, of purpose. Some of you have heard me give the, the speech before, which I won't repeat now, but that the whole Bible is about the coming together of heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and Genesis 1 at creation is filled with these, these pairs that the, the sun and the moon and the, the, the land and, or the sea and the night, morning and evening, day and night. There's all these pairs and the, the climax of all these cosmic pairs is the husband and the wife. And the story of the Bible is of that heaven and earth coming together. So husband and wife are that mystery that represents Christ and the church, which is why Revelation ends the way that it does. 
Revelation 18 is the anti-bride, the whore of Babylon. She's judged. Revelation 19 is the true bride, the church, being wed to Christ. And then Revelation 21, what happens? Literally, the heavens come down to earth because that, that is what this marriage has been about between Christ and the church. It's the cosmic pairing of heaven and earth finally coming together. That's what, that's what marriage symbolizes, which is just one profound reason why marriage must be between a man and a woman, because that's what the whole meta narrative of Scripture is about. The church is a bride wed to her husband, Christ. Building body bride, and then more quickly, family farms, and fullness. I worked really hard to get those three Bs, three Fs. So three other metaphors. You probably are familiar with building body bride, families. So the church is often depicted as a family. 2 Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Matthew 12, 49 through 50. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Ephesians 2.19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. Galatians 6.10, let us do good to everyone as we have opportunity, especially to those who are of the household of God. So this is household imagery, that the church is a family farm, encapsulating a number of ideas. Romans 11, God's people are referred to as an olive tree. 1 Corinthians 3.9, as a field. Jesus in John 10 relates God's people to a flock of sheep. John 15, Matthew 20, we're a vine. So these are all farming images. And then finally, fullness. So here I'm thinking of Ephesians 1.23, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I'm cheating a little bit to try to get the alliteration to work. But fullness, I mean... The church is the earthly representation of spiritual reality, or it's the earthly outpost of heavenly of the heavenly kingdom. Galatians 4:26 refers to the Jerusalem that is above. Hebrews 12:22, the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12:23, the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. So the church is given these lofty titles that we, we are heaven pulled down to earth, the fullness of him. The, the spirit indwells us and indwells the body of Christ. We are the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You could for you know, a Bible study, uh, a youth retreat, you could do a, just a nice few sessions on just understanding the church by looking at these metaphors, building bodies, brides, and then families, farms, fullness, because they all are, they're all getting at the same kind of thing, connected to each other and connected to Christ, but they, they each have a different valence to them. So families speaks of our relationship with one another and how we should support and love one another. Farms speaks to the, the organic nature of this union and the vitality that comes from Christ and that there should be growth and health and fruit bearing and then the fullness metaphor speaks to the heavenly reality and and what we are as this earthly assembly with the heavenly reality made visible those are how to think of some of the names of the church and questions right we'll see what we can do in the last five minutes here with the nature of the church the nature of the church. I want to give you five expressions of the church in the New Testament and then some, some phrases that depict the contrasting nature of the church. We probably won't get to that. So let me just, and again, here are um, putting some of my Presbyterian cards out there for you to consider five expressions of the church in the New Testament. Number one, the church is sometimes the local church. 
Uh, we'll see this, uh, these five categories will, will appear in, in some extent the rest of the class is unpacking some of these distinctions, but just to put you before them, the local church. So for example, 1 Corinthians 11, 18, 14, 19 are speaking to an assembled local body of believers. But we also see that the local church could be those not necessarily uh, assembled at the moment. So, for example, at, uh, Romans 16.4, we read, uh, Priscilla and Aquila who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks for all the churches of the Gentiles, give thanks as well. Or over to Galatians one. To all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So these are local churches, but they wouldn't all be gathered in one place. Sometimes the church is gathered in someone's home, Romans 16, 23, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. So we're very familiar with this use of church, a, a local expression, either gathered in one place or various churches. Second, New Testament sometimes speaks of a group of churches. So Acts 9.31 says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. There the word church is simply ecclesia, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee, well, their church doesn't mean just one local congregation. No, it's the church. The, the, God's people throughout Judea and Galilee. And the fact that it's referred to as the church, now we're so used to that language, just the church, meaning writ large. But think about why, why didn't, why doesn't Acts say, so the church is gathered throughout all Judea and Galilee, the, the each individual local congregation? Well, that was also true, but it begins to make us wonder, can the word church and can church as a concept exist as more than just the local gathered assembly? The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. So the church as a local church, there the church as a group of churches. Third, and we'll have much more to say about this later in the class because this is at the heart of Presbyterianism and the differences between other traditions. The church, number three, as represented by rulers and office bearers. We'll say much more about this later, but when Jesus says in Matthew eighteen seventeen. Tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. That's a locus classicus on whether you're moving towards Presbyterianism or Congregationalism. And I understand it's a very fair argument to say, well, when Jesus says, tell it to the church as the last step of church discipline, isn't he saying, tell it to the assembled congregation? That's why we have congregational polity right there. He doesn't say, tell it to the officers of the church. But the final step of church discipline must be executed by the congregation itself. The argument that you'll see Bannerman and others will make is that the understanding of discipline in, among first century Jews would have assumed the role of the council or the Sanhedrin. That is to say, none of the Jews thought of final disciplinary matters being exercised by the local synagogue. You see this throughout the Gospels, that it is the Sanhedrin, it's the council, it's the, the gathered assembly of the designated rulers and office bearers, so that when Jesus says, tell it to the church, Bannerman's argument is everyone understood that you tell it to the church by telling it to the designated representatives and office bearers of the church. We'll have much more to say about that. Obviously, that's a key point of disagreement. Number four, the New Testament speaks about the church throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians 10, 32, 
Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And number five, the church as all those in heaven or on earth united in Christ. We see this language throughout Ephesians and Colossians. For example, Ephesians 1, 22, Ephesians 3, 21. So the church in these five expressions in the New Testament, a local church, number one, two, a group of churches. Number three, I'll argue a the church as represented by its rulers and office bearers, number four, church throughout the world, and number five, the church as those united to Christ in heaven and on earth. Next week when we come back, we'll pick up here with the nature of the church and look at several contrasting pairs already hinted at, the church as militant and triumphant, as visible and invisible, as Catholic and local, as organism and organization, and as gathered and scattered. Look at those contrasting pairs and how that helps us think about the church. All right, you have your coffee chapel. Have a great week. See you here at 8.30 next Wednesday.